Recording in progress. Okay, hello and welcome. We will be getting started very, very shortly, but um, in the meantime, please let us know where you're tuning in from in the, uh, in the chat box. I know we have folks from all over the, the country today. Great, excellent. So welcome everyone, good evening, and uh, thank you so much for being here with us today. My name is Sophie Lowe, and I'm the Director of Visitor Services and Program Management at the Museum at Eldridge Street. I wanna thank each of you for joining our series, Restoring Stories, uh, featuring our wonderful friend and longtime colleague, Don Ladd from Aurora Lampworks. If you're interested in watching our previous program in this series about restoring decorative paint in the main sanctuary, uh, you can find it on YouTube by searching Museum at Eldridge Street. Now, during this holiday season, we are offering special Lower East Side walking tours every weekend. So if you're interested, please check out our website and you can learn more about our other programs that we have for people of all ages. And of course, don't forget, uh, you can always visit our museum. We are open to the public now. You can join a docent led tour and just see how magnificent uh, the historic sanctuary is. And you can see it right behind me. Uh, we're in the museum right now. So tonight's program uh, is captioned and it is powered by Zoom. So if you wish to turn this on, you can uh, press the CC button at the top or bottom of the Zoom screen. And since we're using AI, please forgive any typos that might occur. So today we'll start with a brief presentation by Dawn, and that will be followed by a short discussion and then a Q&A. So I urge you all to ask as many questions as you might have uh, throughout the program in the Q&A box, and we'll get to as many as we can. So now I want to introduce Dawn Ladd. Uh, Dawn founded Aurora Lampworks in 1983, and a love and appreciation for well-made objects has followed her from a small business making custom landscapes to restoring some of the country's most treasured landmark buildings. Now at heart, Dawn is a conservationist and environmentalist, and she incorporates her closely held principles into her work restoring historic lighting fixtures. She says that it is particularly rewarding to be in the business of lighting restoration when we are in the midst of a technological revolution with the advent of LEDs. Dawn is a member of the IALD, IES, and New York Landmarks Conservancy. Aurora Lampworks has grown and earned an outstanding reputation in the lighting industry, and they have a team of designers, artisans, blacksmiths, conservators, glassmakers, and finishers to deal with the huge diversity of materials used in the fabrication of lighting fixtures. And regardless of style, period, or material, Aurora is prepared with appropriate techniques and exemplary craftspeople to complete the scope of work. So making lighting fixtures meant to last is an important part of a conservation ethic they live and work by. And Aurora Lampworks holds a WBE certificate from the state of New York. Now, everyone, please welcome Don Ladd. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Sophie. It is, it's so wonderful to be here back in the sanctuary. And I have to say it looks just as beautiful as the day that we left it when we, uh, after the, the, the restoration uh, 13 years ago. I thought that maybe what we might do to begin my talk is to take a, a, a couple of moments and pan around the sanctuary for those people who maybe have never been here or people that haven't been here in a while and take a look at uh, the, the, the various fixtures.
Hello, everyone. Welcome. I would like to take a moment to do a, a pan of the of the entire space, so you get a sense of how how beautiful it is and the diversity of the of the lighting fixtures. We'll be talking about those more in depth in a little while. But we're going to start, and what you see in your upper left hand uh, part of your screen is the crystal chandelier in the women's balcony. And then panning a little bit right in front of us, you'll see the column sconces that wrap around the columns in the sanctuary. These columns span 50 feet from the bottom floor to the top. Moving along, we are going to see uh, on the upper part of your screen, we're going to see the crown and basket fixtures, the sconces, and we're going to be talking about those in detail in a little while. So continuing moving uh, along, you will see the BEMA fixtures below in the bottom part of your screen. And of course, the grand chandelier, which has 75 different lights on it. And then moving towards the east wall of the sanctuary, you'll see the eternal light, the arc light, and the menorah. Okay, great. So you can see what an amazing space it is and the ambiance that's, that's, uh, that's created in this space. Every single light that you saw as we panned around, there are over 350 lights in this sanctuary. And I'd like to give you a, um, a brief timeline of the sanctuary because it's going to become really relevant for uh, the different talking points that I go through. So the, the sanctuary was built in 1887. That would have been before electricity came to New York City or uh, to this part of the city. The sanctuary was electrified in 1907. Uh, and in 1980 through the 1940s, this space was very, very much in use. In 1950 through the 19, to, uh, through 1980, uh, the, the space was not used and it fell into a little bit of disrepair because of the no climate control uh, and because of roof leaks and because of um, um, the pigeons that made their homes here. So what I'd like to do at this moment is to try to take us back to a point 130 years ago when this sanctuary, when this space was lit by gas. And so what I've done is created a little portable gas station here. And, and what we're gonna do is light this. And so that you can really try to imagine what this space looked like 350 years ago, no electricity, all gas. So here we go. You got that on. Good, and I'm gonna turn on the gas. If you listen closely, you will hear the gas flowing through the gas line and into the gas jets. I'm gonna stand back. So these are just two, four, six gas jets that are burning right now. So try to imagine 350 of these going. Now I'm gonna turn this down. There it is, pull up. Here it is kind of in the middle. And this is probably, this is probably the level that, that the sanctuary, the gas lights were in most of the time. So one thing about gas is that when gas burns, there are natural, there are byproducts of combustion. And those byproducts create a dirty, um, a, a dirty film on, on, on objects. And we all know that probably from our own experience when we've lit candles in the room and we leave them on for a while. And if we look up at the ceiling, you'll see sort of a, you know, a ring of dark black soot. The other analogy is, is that if you have a gas burning car and you, and you, and you see what the exhaust is coming out of the back, that is the same kind of byproduct created by combustion. So the sanctuary would have been very warm. 
because I can feel the heat coming from here. It would have been noisy with the gas going through the gas jets, which you might have heard before, and it would have been dirty. Uh, and, and, and so this is going to lead into the next part of my talk, which is the restoration of the, of the lighting fixtures in the sanctuary. One thing to say about the restoration <clears throat> was that our directive right from the beginning was that every single object that could possibly be reused and saved was. So you will see in some of the upcoming slides that there were pieces that could have been easily replaced and probably would have been less expensive to do so. But that was not what, what, the, what the design team wanted. They wanted to reuse everything that could be reused and was structurally sound. So let's take a look at a couple of SOT slides now. All right, so this, this slide that you're seeing is one of the crown and basket fixtures, which we saw in the beginning when we panned around the room. And what's interesting about this, this photo or this image that you see is you can see on top the gas burning jets. Uh, uh, the electric components would have been added later in um, when electricity was brought into the sanctuary. So let's take a look at the next slide. So here's a, here's a close-up of image of the grand chandelier, which you saw before. And when you look at this, you will see, you can see the level of corrosion that was on this fixture. The byproducts of, of gas, as I said before, just love to go and attack metal. You'll also see in this image that there, um, there's a good amount of green, verdigris, and that is that, that shows that there was a lot of moisture in this space and leaks because grass turns green when it's exposed to moisture. Okay, next slide. Another close up of the bottom of the grand chandelier, again, showing the, the level of corrosion and the, and, the, and the green. Next slide, please. So this is a really good example of a piece of that chandelier. And as you can see, it is, it's, it's very corroded. The top of the neck of this piece has split. The bottom around the edge has split and curled. It is covered with corrosion. It would have been a fairly easy task to recreate this piece, but that was not, that, that was not our goal. Let's go to the next slide where you'll see this is a, um, a body of a fixture that we weren't able to see when we pan because it's in the front foyer. And I really encourage people when you come to look at it because it's really particularly beautiful. But you can see the holes where the arms go through have almost, the corrosion has almost gone all the way through and it's become pretty structurally unsound. Next slide. So here's that beautiful uh, chandelier that's in the foyer in the entrance. And you will see that unlike the other uh, original glass in the sanctuary, this, this had a rose colored pink glass, particularly beautiful. And what you see in this image right here is that ball that has been reconstructed, reinforced, cleaned and polished and lacquered and reused. All right, let's take a look at the next. So the grand chandelier that has 75 lights on it, as I mentioned before, came apart in over 400 pieces. Every single one of those pieces was disassembled and was cleaned and prepared, polished and, and lacquered. And so there you see it laying out on our table at the shop. And there is a finished photo of the, of, the, uh, of the bottom of the chandelier after it's been polished and lacquered. And I love this one. It is the, the before and the after. Okay, wonderful. 
so what I'd like to do, what I'd like to focus on now, I, it, there are so many different fixture types in the sanctuary. There, there are eight different fixture types and multiples of many of them. I could spend hours um, talking about the restoration of each particular type. But what I would like to do right now is to discuss um, uh, the replication component of, of this project, which was in our scope. So as I said, the, the sanctuary was, in, uh, was not used for a number of years. And during that time, some of the, uh, the crown and basket sconces, that <clears throat> one that's right above me, uh, went missing. So part of our scope was to replicate um, the, those fixtures. And so what I'd like to do is just take you a little bit through so that you understand the different components of this fixture. So as with most fixtures, we have a back plate. This is what attaches to the wall or to the junction box. This is where the electrical connections are made. This is the stem, which brings the fixture out from the wall into, into the space. This is the, the basket uh, part of the fixture. And then up on top, which may be a little hard for you to see, but you're gonna get, you're gonna get a closer look in a minute, is the, uh, the crown part. It has a finial uh, on the top and on the bottom, and inside is the splice, which holds it all together, and it supports the arms that are coming off. So when we were first asked to, uh, to replicate these fixtures, uh, it became, it, we had never made anything. We had never made anything quite like this. These, uh, these are really old world techniques. These are, uh, something that is not that all that common. Fortunately, with Aurora, uh, we, we have a whole network of artisans. We have people that we work with and we help each other out because every restoration project is different. You never see the same fixture twice, let alone a fixture like this, which is really, really unusual. So in talking with a, um, a, a friend and a, a blacksmith in New York City, I, I asked, I said, I, you know, what do you think is the best way to reproduce these? And he said, well, there's a way to do it and it's called chasing and it requires a substance called pitch. And so we, we understood we had a whole learning curve which was very exciting uh, to learn exactly how to reproduce these fixtures. I brought along some props to try to help us understand exactly how it happens. And I think the best thing, and I'm gonna put this right up at the close so that maybe you can see it and take a look at the inside. Uh, the best analogy that I can come up with is that when you, make, when you bake cupcakes, you take batter and you pour the batter into a mold you put the mold in the oven, it hardens, comes out of the oven, and there you have a cupcake. Well, it's very similar what happens with these fixtures and the fabrication of these fixtures. So this would be the, the cupcake mold. And this material called pitch, which is a very viscous uh, material that's like a sap, but it's, it's, it's just the right additives so that it's hardened but it allows, it, it takes the shape and it gives you something that later you're going to, to chase, you're going to, to hit against. So I'm gonna show you now. This is the, this is the shape that we, were, that we were going for, for the top of the fixtures. And this is the shape of the bottom of the fixtures. So I'm gonna take you through now how we got there. I'm gonna give these back. So again, we have, we have this, there's pitch inside of here. There's a hard substance inside of here. It's turned out uh, um, upside down on the table and we create a, a rubbing. Fortunately, there were some original fixtures, so we were actually able to take a rubbing and get the exact pattern that we wanted. That pattern is laid down. I'm going to get away from the flames. That, that pattern is laid down on here. And then with a series of custom chisels, 
we cut out those perforations. Can I have that, the, um, the, the perforated one again? So this is gonna become really clear because I'm gonna show you some slides, but um, I hope you can see this because here's the shade. And we had to make custom chisels. So you see when, when there is um, a, uh, an indentation along here, along this design, but it doesn't go all the way through. So there was a special chisel that we made that's kind of in the round. I don't know if you're able to, to pick that up, but that this is slowly centimeter by centimeter tapped along there, not going all the way through to the pitch, but just far enough to kind of get that impression that we're going for. With another special chisel or a punch, the center depression is made just by tapping a little bit. This is not easy stuff. This really takes sort of an artist's eye. Then when you wanted to get all of the all of the, um, the, the perforations, there would be a, a chisel that would look like this, which is a, uh, a chisel custom made from a hardened steel. And then it is slowly but surely tapped around and then the piece falls through. So the ideal of the pitch is that when you hit this, it has just enough give. So it kind of bounces back it doesn't, if this were just wood, your chisel would get stuck. If there weren't anything in there, this would just buckle and collapse. So the pitch became a really, really important uh, element of this. And, and, and so what I'd like to do now is to show you some slides and then it, I think it'll best um, explain sort of the process. Okay, so here you see the pitch. <clears throat> it's in liquid form. It's been heated up in an oven and it's poured into that, that mold that you saw before. Here's another image of, of the person um, pouring it in. And then you can see, you can see the next image of that one, of this, uh, this pattern is glued all around the, uh, the mold. And then the tapping begins. Thousands and thousands of little taps per fixture. We had eight artisans working eight hours a day. Everybody, most people had headphones on for most of the day. It kind of, <laughs> it was really very loud. Here's, a, here's an image. Um, if you can go back one, there's, there's an image of all of this, the, the pieces that have been uh, that have been chased, laid out on the table and ready to be assembled. Next image is, there is one of uh, our artisans and you can see that she's got that, that, that pitch propped up a little bit. So she has just the right angle and she's able to, to, uh, to perforate the, uh, the metal. All right. And there again is the finished product. And, and, and um, you can see how, how beautiful they are. And, and we were so happy with this project because we learned so much. We were able to, to utilize every skill that we had that we've ever known, that we had ever known and add to new skills. Uh, and so it was such a, a meaningful, rewarding project. What I'd like to discuss now is the beautiful glass on the fixtures. And I have, I have a, uh, a sample down here um, that I'd like to show you. John, before we get to that part, uh, I just wanna throw in a couple of questions that some people have already uh, been asking. So what is the origin of this technique? And do you know if other places in the United States have used this kind of restoration technique? 
I didn't quite get that, Sophie. <coughs> sure, I'll ask that again. Uh, someone was asking, what is the origin of this technique? And are there other places in the United States that have the same kind of uh, restoration technique? I think that there, I haven't seen too many. Um, it, these were really the first fixtures in all of the 40 years that we've been doing restoration um, fixtures. I've never seen anything that, that's quite like this. These fixtures were probably, they were, they were so old, they were before laser cutting and before um, uh, you know, metal stamping. And so probably these were done in countries um, uh, like Turkey or maybe um, Israel or um, any, any sort of kind of quote unquote old world countries. That's how old these are. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and another question was, uh, we know that the restoration process of the main sanctuary took 20 years. Uh, how long did it take Aurora to complete this restoration process? How long did it take you and the artisans and all the different people to complete, uh, complete all of the little uh, lamp works? All of the... Um... The entire project uh, probably lasted two years. Uh, it was done in stages. So, uh, you know, you start on disassembling and those pieces are cleaned and, and prepped for, um, for finishing. And so it, it's, it's all kind of done at the same time. The idea is that they all literally come out of the oven at the same time. Uh, and so that's part of the sorry, sort of choreography that you have to do on a project like this, where the things that are going to take the longest, you have to jump into in the beginning, and the things that are going to be move along faster, you can kind of put those on the on the on the uh, then the back burner. Does that answer your your question? Yeah, it does. And in fact, someone else has asked a question about this, um, and they wanted to know what type of lacquer was used for the fixture. So was it acrylic lacquer, for example? Uh, they wanted to know how long that lasts and whether or not relacquering is needed. Well, the purpose of lacquer is to, is to protect the, the, the finish. Um, there are various types and makers of lacquer. This was not an acrylic lacquer. Um, it is applied to, uh, to protect the, the finish from the, the elements. No lacquer these days with sort of the pollutants in the air um, is going to last forever. But uh, I think that in a climate control space like that we have here, when you look around, you look up here and you see that these fixtures are holding up beautifully. And these were, these were done 13 years ago. So I think on a climate control space like this that you can expect a good 20, 25 years from, uh, from a lacquer code. Fantastic. And um, for everyone else, please keep the questions coming in and we'll, we'll get to them. So Don, you were telling us about glass. Talk about the glass now. Okay, great. So, so, Fortunately, a number of the original glass shades were still in the sanctuary. And I'd like, to, I'd like to discuss them a little bit because they're very, very, very special. And I'm gonna hold this up as, as close as I can to the camera. It's a little hard to see on the, on the sconce that's above me because the light kind of, you know, uh, the camera kind of blows the, the design of the, uh, of the glass out. And so I'm going to hold this up for you. This too would have been blown into a mold. These were made in France over 100 years ago, and there would be a mold, and then molten glass would have been poured into this mold. What's interesting about this piece of glass and the pieces of glass that were remaining in the sanctuary is that You'll notice that they're frosted on the, on the end this, uh, to sort of protect any glare. They're clear in the middle. They're tinged with green on the outside. They're fluted and 
there is a beautiful etched pattern, our pattern on them. Very, very, very special glass. N nobody in the world makes glass that's this intricate anymore. So what we try to do in the restoration of, um, of, the, of the sanctuary was to use as many of the original pieces of glass as possible. We, and we put those in sort of the primary uh, viewing, uh, in, in the viewing uh, for, uh, for your viewing eye. And where we couldn't replicate these, we got a, a piece of glass that was kind of picked up the same kind of shape. Um, so along, the, along those lines of the glass is that it became really important when the restoration was first done in 2008 to choose an electric bulb that was fulfilled a number of criteria. One is that it fit inside the glass. Two, that it didn't get too hot for the glass. Three, that it was dimmable. So you could turn, you could turn the, the, uh, the light up for reading and cleaning. And very importantly, it could be dimmed down to try to create the same atmosphere as would have been with 350 gas burning fixtures in the this, in this sanctuary. So a lot of time and effort was put into the bulbs. Um, at that time, they were, they were all uh, incandescent bulbs. In 2016, the sanctuary decided to to investigate what were the options for LED bulbs. LED bulbs, as we probably all know, are more expensive up front, but they last a lot longer and they use way less electricity. So we went through a series of mock-ups and to each and every one of these fixtures to find the best available LED bulb on the market. And what you see here was the best at the time, the 2016. And I'd like to just turn this, um, oh, I think I can just turn this on. So take a look at this. Uh, you know, here is the original gas burning flame. And this is the LED bulb that's been dimmed. And as you can see, the color is pretty, is pretty good. And it would took a lot of consideration and a lot of samples to get us to this point. So in after in, in 2016, uh, with LEDs being more commonplace and better quality, the sanctuary decided to relamp to all LED bulbs to both conserve on electricity and to serve on maintenance. So we were contracted to come in and while we were at it, we, we, we dusted every single fixture in the sanctuary with special microfiber, I'm gonna hand this back to you, special microfiber um, um, dusters, took out every piece of glass, washed that glass, put it back into the holders and put in the new LED bulbs. And so I would like to show you a couple of images of that. And so you get a, you get a sense of, of, of the glass before and after and how important it is to choose the right bulb for, for, the, for the application. So there you have a beautiful picture of the, of the glass. Here's a picture of the, of the glass when we first uh, started the restoration and you can see the soot and the dirt and the grime on these pieces of glass. And, and then the next slide, you see all of the glass being laid out, very meticulously taken out, washed individually, dried, and then put back in. And this has to be one of my favorite images which is of one of, our, of one of our artisans who was here cleaning the glass. And you can really get the sense of somebody in a kind of meditative state. And I would like to close by saying that 
it's very easy to get into a meditative state when you're in the sanctuary. It feels warm, inviting, safe, quiet, and, and just really, really beautiful in, in a kind of, in a way I've tried to describe here, but I think that you have to see for yourself. And I hope everyone will make the trip to the sanctuary and see and, 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 feel, and feel what it's like to be here. Thanks so much, Sophie. If you have any questions now, um, I'd be happy to, to try to answer them. Yeah, Don, thank you so much. I mean, I think what you just said is so true. And that's why when we were talking about doing this program, uh, we, we went through the trouble of actually setting up in here at the museum, uh, which is very eerie, I have to say, because it's just the two of us in such a large space. Um, but we just felt that it was absolutely necessary to be in this space to talk about uh, the restoration process, to really see what the flames look like uh, right in front of you. Uh, could you actually just show the audience again uh, what it looks like to, to turn the flames up and down? Okay, sure. Okay, so... <laughs> That's the brightest that we get. That would take a lot of energy and create a lot of heat. What I understand is that during the high holidays, holidays there might have been as many as 1,000 people in the sanctuary. 500 people downstairs, 500 women upstairs, and, and the amount of heat and body heat, it must have been really quite, quite an atmosphere. So this is, this is how low the, the gas flames can go, about like that, what you would consider maybe a candle in your, in your house. Uh, what, I, what I don't think the audience can hear is that when you turned that gas lamp up, you, it just, I could hear it and I'm on the other side of the sanctuary from you. It's so loud, you can almost hear this. It's like a fluttering sound, it's really incredible. Uh, we have a couple of other questions, uh, but first I wanted to ask you, how did you come to this project at Eldridge? I was brought into uh, this project um, through the architects um, uh, orig uh, originally and Walter Sedovic uh, architects. And um, I looked at this project maybe two years um, and then fundraising was happened happening and it was two years later, we got the call and was like, okay, we're ready to go. And, uh, and so that was a really, really exciting, uh, exciting moment. Uh, and as I said, it's really a restorer's dream to, to be involved in a project like this because you get to use every single skill that you ever knew uh, that you had, that you ever, that, you use every single skill that you know, and then we learn many new skills as well. Someone asked, uh, I seem to remember from a tour that you went back to the original glass factory in France to ask if they could create some new glass to replace the glass that was missing. Can you talk a little bit about that process? Yeah, I would like, I would, I would love to. Um, as you saw with the glass that I held up before, it's very, very special. We went to a glass factory that's in, been in business for 200 years in, in France. We actually found the original mold for the glass and it was very, very exciting. And we all had our hopes really up that we were going to be able to reproduce, reproduce this uh, incredible glass. And so then they began sending us samples and they couldn't get it right. They just couldn't get it right. Apparently that company had been sold maybe 50 years ago now, maybe 60 years ago. And all the old timers who knew how to blow glass and knew how to do the etching, they, had, they weren't there any longer. And the new crew, they could get the shape, but they could not get the color and they could not get the etching. And so at that point it was, okay, let's take a path of lesser resistance. Let's get a piece of glass that's easily replaceable, obtainable, 
and 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 go with that. So that that's the that's the story on that. Someone also asked, are all of the crown and basket fixtures replicated? Are there any original ones that still exist? Um, okay, great question. Let's see. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there were um, there were some original crown and basket fixtures, and that's why we were able to to get that rubbing and to get the exact pattern. And so we used one of them to to create our pattern. So I think that we made eight all together, which included the, uh, the uh, crown and basket sconces, and it included part of the eternal light. So why don't you tell us now about some of the greater challenges you may have encountered? I mean, the, the individual um, hammering of the, of the fixture certainly seemed really difficult, but was there anything else that we haven't heard yet? Well, I think that the, um, the, the scale of the project was, um, was, it was a very large scale project, lowering down the grand chandelier, which is fortunately on a winch, was very exciting because it, it was it was all taken apart and could be disassembled and easily carried out. You know, it's it's remarkable how a big uh, chandelier with so much volume breaks down to a relatively small kind of package, as you saw on that image of uh, the pieces all spread out on the on the table. Um, the wiring was really interesting because. Um, the wiring, all the circuits that go up are um, very neatly hidden on the chain and the, and the wires go up there. I don't even think you can see the wires that go up that chain. So that was a very painstaking um, uh, process. I think the other thing that was, that was challenging is that although uh, Aurora is a UL underwriters listed um, um, shop, which means we're able to apply underwriters labels to fixtures. When they are outside of a general umbrella, which is a pretty small umbrella, then we have to, we have to evaluate them as a field evaluation. So these column sconces here, when, when they were originally taken down, they just had wires that went from one from, from one socket to the next. And it, what, uh, behind it all, there was just like spaghetti and that would never fly with UL. So we made individual sconce, well, individual little splice boxes that are tucked behind. So you'd never see them. And, and they were up to UL standards. You know, safety has got to be the very first uh, concern along with, um, uh, with the aesthetics. So how much of the actual uh, uh, electrical aspect of, of this project did you, did you have to consider or, or work, work on? Uh, well, you really have to think about, you really have to go backwards. You have to think about the installation, how it's going to be installed, if it's gonna be up to code, and then you kind of work your way from the, the, the installation forward. You also work your way from the bulb that you're going to use backwards. So it's, it's a real kind of thinking of the whole project very holistically and to understand uh, what's possible, what's safe, and what is going to be you, uh, uh, able to be UL labeled. I mean, I, it's just so incredible how much time and effort and thought was put into uh, every detail. And I think um, today when people walk in and they see this beautifully restored space, it's easy to take it for granted because you just think, wow, gorgeous chandelier and beautiful glass. You forget that, wow, someone actually came in and sampled however many different LED light bulbs just to make sure to find the perfect one. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's incredible. It's uh, a, now, oh, sorry, go ahead. 
it's just a, it's a whole process from the beginning to the end and and i i would say that of the many projects that we've worked on that this project was really special in that as i've mentioned before we were given pretty much free reign to do the best job that we knew how to do and to reuse every piece that could be possibly reused and the, all of the artisans, there's certainly more artisans than, than the lighting restoration that were involved in this. And I know you have a series on the different artisans that, that were part of this. And I would say that there was a feeling here of all the various artisans that we were a real community and that we didn't, we didn't, we made sure that we didn't get in each other's way. It was a real, real sense of cooperativeness and it was so pleasant and I have to say that that the director Bonnie Diamond and and the crew that she put together could not have been nicer to work with and we always want to do the best job that we that we can but to have this other feeling of camaraderie and community is just was just a really this has to be one of my very favorite projects that we've ever done. Uh, Don, I, I have to tell you, uh, I think, you know, we, we are so grateful for the people who worked on our project, but every, every other day I, uh, I can hear Bonnie telling us about the work that you all did and how <laughs> much, but, but also the, the fact that this, this building was, um, is so special to you. I think that really, it, it really shows uh, I believe at one point you had mentioned that the building is, I think, one of our greatest assets or something like that, where this is this is our artifact. I mean, it really is uh, the, the time that was spent caring for. Yeah. Really and you incredible. can really tell it because when I walked in here, it just looked as pristine and as well cared for and well as well loved as when we left. And that is there's there's that's as rewarding as it gets as a restorer to walk into a space that you've done 13 years ago and find it as well kept and well loved and well as well maintained as this as this space. So Don, we just have a couple more minutes left and I wanna address a few other questions that's come up. Um, someone has asked about the ladies crystal chandelier and I'm gonna move my camera up actually so that our audience members might be able to see uh we have this chandelier here that's not quite like the others uh dawn do you have anything that you might be able to say about this i do and i'm, I'm glad you brought it up um you know there's so much to talk about that it's hard uh you know there there's so many stories in the sanctuary, but this is this is a really good one in that I believe that this chandelier was donated somewhere uh, along the line. I'm not sure of the sort of, uh, you know, the provenance on it, but this chandelier, like other fixtures, like the grand chandelier, when that was gas or when in that particular chandelier, when it was candle, it would have been turned upside down or right side up, right? So right now, somebody, when it was rewired, turned the arms down, probably to get a little bit more light on the surface areas below. And when it came to, when it came to decision making like that, the directive was reuse, let it tell a story. Let, it, it's an interesting story and don't change it. Just leave it, leave it the way that you found it. And that's what we did. And two more questions. Uh, someone asked, what is the ratio between the original glass shades and the new ones? And uh, I guess I'll just piggyback off of that. Uh, when you were looking into restoring the, or, or trying to replicate the, the glass lampshades to find the same exact one, when you went back to the French factory and realized that uh, they're not able to recreate the glass, were there other possibilities like 
was there any other, were there any other artisans, perhaps in other parts of France or in other countries that you were able to locate who possibly could have recreated the glass or was it in fact just, this doesn't exist anymore? Well, I think that once we found the, um, the original manufacturer and we found the mold, that anything short of that, you know, would have been um, a just, a, a, just a, you know, a, a disappointment and it would have been, it, it wouldn't have been close enough. So if you're not gonna get particularly close, you might as well just go really different and let it be a story of like, these are different glass shades and they are replacement shades. We're not trying to make something look like it was original when it's not, let it be its own story. And I think that that was the directive that we took. There's also a time element on this. You know, it's you're dealing with, you're dealing with another country and you're dealing with samples. And at some point it was like, okay, let's, let's, let's take the shortest distance um, here and make it, make it look good and get it, get it done. And it can be revisited afterwards. And so that's what we did. And I'll say too that when, when you come in and, and see the new glass shades in the room, I mean, it's still very, very beautiful. Um, and it's actually quite, it's quite fascinating to see the different colors that we have because you'd shown the, the other uh, lampshade in the vestibule that was pink. The one right next to you is green. And then this replicated new lampshade, it's this sort of opaque white color. Um, so it also sort of adds this extra element uh, to the room, to the sanctuary as just something else to look at and another reminder about the history that uh, this, this building has seen, right? The past, the present. Mm -hmm. um, and to that, my final question for you is, you completed the restoration work in 2007, you came back in 2016. What now, where do we go here from now? Are we done forever? Uh, what do you think? Uh, I think that uh, that probably um, we're good on the LEDs. <laughs> you know, like that. There's a technology change. You know, every, every well with LEDs, it seems to be very fast. But typically, there's a real technology change every 50 years, and so we've already kind of gone through that from you know from gas to electric, and and so here we are, and now we have a good choice of LED uh, of LED bulbs. I don't see anything really drastically changing. There may be in a year or two, a better lamp that dims better, or, you know, there's always changes. The, the LED market is, is, is changing so rapidly. So it's possible that there might be a better bulb, but honestly, I, I don't see any problem with sort of the bulbs that have been chosen and that have been uh, in the sanctuary for what um, are we talking five years now? So I think that that's, um, that's, that's a good long longevity. And I don't think that there'll be any need to change the lamping. I think that what will be really important is to every several years is to have somebody clean all the fixtures and and dust them and clean the glass and that that's probably where where we go from here wonderful don thank you again for coming all the way here uh, to eldridge street to show this to us tonight um, to our audience members thank you for uh, watching us from wherever you are <laughs> next time you come here to eldridge street just take an extra look and look, look up and pay extra close attention because um, it really is remarkable, the work that they were able to do. Really, really incredible. Um, Don, just thank you again. Uh, I just wanna wish everyone a wonderful evening and also to look out on the calendar for the next Restoring Stories. Uh, we're going to be talking about the stained glass windows Next. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it'll be really fun um, to hear about that. All right. Wonderful. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. <laughs>